All right, so this is our second lecture in exergy. And uh, looking ahead, one week ahead, what happens? I'm going to hopefully hand out the take-home exam. So you need to be solving problems, okay? And that's my encouragement to you. Make sure you don't fall behind early in the semester. Stay up to date in this class. So last time we talked about the exergy for a closed system, we had a formula for a new property called exergy. Um, it was something like U minus U naught. So the internal energy, the specific internal energy of the system at the current state minus if it goes to the dead state, that's U naught, plus P naught, the dead state pressure times V minus V naught, minus T naught times S minus S naught, plus if there's any kinetic or any potential energy, P E or K, P K E. Uh, we need to get to an exergy balance for a closed system today, as well as need to get to, for an open system, we'll have a different exergy. We'll have the flow exergy, and we'll have a different exergy balance for an open system. All right, so if somebody says we're going to develop or derive or show you the derivation of this exergy balance for a closed system, first of all, you might think, well, it's probably going to look like a lot like an energy balance for a closed system. This is also called first law. So from memory, this is the way I'm encouraging you. Um, if you can do this, you'll be better prepared for the material that we're covering. If you can remember, recall the first law of thermodynamics for a closed system undergoing a process, what's it look like? Well, it'd be the total final energy at the end of the process minus the initial energy that change is sometimes represented by delta E, and it's made of three components, change in internal, change in kinetic, change in potential energy. Often the changes in kinetic and potential energy are negligible, but sometimes they're not. But this is how you might want to write it. And then how can that energy of the system increase or decrease? How can it change? It can change by an energy transfer into the system by heat, and it can change by a work. Now our sign convention is that heat in is positive, and that work out is positive, hence the negative sign in front of the work. A good review of thermal one, true? How about, uh, I misspelled this word, entropy balance. What is the second law for a closed system undergoing a process. If we, if we can recall that from memory, as well as the first law, then we're well on our way to understanding the new exergy balance, because they're going to look very similar. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, it'd be something like the final entropy minus initial entropy. You know, that term right there for the energy balance looks a whole lot like the entropy balance equation right away on the left-hand side, doesn't it? It's equal to how it can transfer in. Hmm. How can entropy transfer into the system and how can it transfer out of the system? Well, it can transfer in with some heat transfer. But it's not just proportional to heat transfer. We divide by some Tb and then do the integral over the process. So if the Tb is constant, then it's just Q1 to 2 divided by Tb if, if uh, Tb is constant, if Tb equal to a constant. What again is the subscript B on that temperature for? For the boundary temperature, right. Okay, that's how entropy is transferred with the heat. We see the analogy in the equations, they're very similar. Is there a term in the entropy balance that matches with the work? Does, is there enter, entropy transfer with work? There's entropy transfer definitely with the heat transfer. Is there an entropy transfer with the work transfer? Okay. We're going to have another term. There'll be the last term. It'll be the entropy generated during the process. Sometimes I like to write a subscript 1 to 2 because I'm talking about process 1 to 2, and then later I'll talk about the process 2 to 3, so I'll change the subscripts. Or the book just leaves the subscripts off in general. But that's the entropy 
uh, generation due to irreversibilities. But is there a term here for entropy either brought in or out with the, let's put a negative sign, and uh, it goes with the work. Work is energy transfer out, true? So is there a term here or not? No, no. And why? Why is there no analogous term for entropy transfer? Well, let me give you the answer because it's a hard question. What exactly is entropy? Go to the physicist, take three classes, three semesters, a year and a half, maybe two years worth of classes, and maybe you'll figure it out. But maybe they'll just leave you as confused as anything because what is time? Trying to find time once. Really, it's hard. These concepts are hard. Anyway, engineers like very simple understanding of complex issues. Entropy is a measure of disorder of the system or substance, especially on a molecular level. That works. It works beautifully. Oh, it's not perfect. Somebody will, you know, throw a stone at that definition and say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, I don't have two years to learn it. Okay, it, it did at a different level, like two years to understand time. But I can work with time. Okay, so if it's measure of disorder, especially at a molecular level, and then we think about what heat is. Heat is a transfer due to a temperature difference. And if I have something that's hot, I have it very energetic at a molecular level, more disorder. If it's cold, very slow and less disorder on a molecular level. So when you transfer heat by a temperature difference, you're transferring disorder. What about work? Well, it's an, think of a shaft rotating. All the molecules in that shaft are all aligned up. And it's just transferring energy, but it's really not transferring disorder. So energy transfer without disorder, transferring increasing disorder of the system, is work. That's kind of the definition of work. And so there is no entropy transfer with work. Good review of Thermal 1, I hope. Now let's talk about an exergy balance. Well, I'm going to derive it, but what would we think it looks like? It'll probably have a term like, oh, the final exergy of the system minus the initial exergy of the system is equal to what? How exergy is transferred with the heat, the heat transfer, right? And then we're going to ask the same question. Could exergy transfer with the work? And could exergy be destroyed? Or could exergy be generated, just like the entropy equation? And so in, we'll have, let me just leave it as a general transfer of exergy with Q. Leave it with a general exergy transfer with work. And this term was entropy. It was a generation. Do you think we're going to have an exergy generation or destruction? Unfortunately, irreversibilities destroy the ability to do something useful in the future, so it's going to be a destruction. This is what the equation really looks like that we're going to derive. So that entropy transfer with the heat, hmm, look at that. It looks a lot like this equation, doesn't it? The integral from 1 to 2, 1 over Tb times del Q. But the integrand is a little different, isn't it? And I like to think of the T naught, the environmental temperature, is like the low temperature. And my current system is hot. If I bring it into thermal equilibrium with the system, I'm going to cool it down, or with the environment, I'm going to cool it down. But normally, I think of Tb is greater than T naught. It's like the high temperature. So if I look at this equation, it's 1 minus TL over TH. Hey, I think I've seen that before, haven't I? What does that look like? The Carnot efficiency, right, out of thermal 1. 1 minus TL over TH is the maximum efficiency of a heat engine. All right. This term right here is very complicated, but it's our exergy transfer with the work. It's the same kind of concept is you have the total amount of work 
but you have to subtract off some non-useful component and only have the useful transfer of work. What is the non-useful component? Can you see what that is? That's you're subtracting it off. It's P naught times the change in volume. That's if my, exp my system expands. And in the expansion, it just has to make room pushing back the boundary. So that's a non-useful component. You subtract that from the total work, and that's then the useful work. That is one-to-one -one with the exergy transfer. And then the exergy destruction, well, you can see the equation for that. It's related to sigma entropy production, and we have T naught, the dead state. So this is probably the simplest and most used equation in this whole chapter. What is the magnitude of the exergy destruction in terms of entropy generation? Well, let's go ahead and go through this derivation. It is very similar to the derivation of the property exergy that we did last time. Very, very similar. We start with a system. We have its local environment. The environment's at T naught, P naught. The system's undergoing a process. During that process, it can push back the environment, expand into the environment and it could produce some useful work out of the system. What do we do? We do a first law for the system. Does this look okay for the first law for the system? Then we think about that work here and we think, okay, it's the sum of two components. One is the useful component. The other is just pushing back the environment. So we're gonna expand this work term into two terms in the energy balance. Then we go to the second law, entropy balance, and we write it this way. And it's very similar. We just had that equation up. You take this, you say, okay, we're going to let the, um, we're going to multiply this whole equation, all three terms, by T naught, and then subtract it from the first equation. So I get one equation. It'll be a combination of first and second law. There it is. I then take this term, which came here, and rearrange it, put it over onto the left-hand side. I look at terms on the left-hand side and say, hey, I recognize that. That's my change in the property called exergy. And what is about this? I combine this term with this term, where I have that T naught multiplied, and I have an integral of some new integrand, del Q, Oh, that looks like my exergy transfer with heat. And then this is my useful energy transfer or work. And that's one to one with EW. That's just the exergy transfer with the work. It's how much useful work was transferred. And we have that exergy destruction, which is equal to sigma T naught. That whole derivation is done on one page. You're probably saying, oh, wow. Um, anyway, it takes it maybe a while to digest a derivation like this. If you're interested, the textbook has a good discussion of this. Uh, I could spend more time talking about it, but this is good enough. That's our derivation. All right? That's our exergy balance. It's a combination of first and second law. And we're going to use our new property called exergy. Let's start solving some problems. We have a rigid, well-insulated tank. The tank contains five kilograms of steam at this pressure and temperature. A paddle wheel stirs the steam. So you could think of our system come in with the paddle wheel, classic problem in Thermo 1, and it's going to stir up that steam. Until at the end of the process, the new pressure, the pressure of the steam in the container, is one bar. Ignore the effects of motion and gravity, so neglect kinetic potential energy effects. If needed, let the dead state temperature be 20 degrees C and the dead state pressure be 100 kilopascal. Determine the final temperature of the steam. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause. I'm going to let you digest this problem. There's a lot to digest. And then I'm going to wait until I get about five people that will give me the right answer for this. And then I'll move on, okay? So let's get five people to uh, solve this problem for the temperature, the final temperature. The equal sign, I'll make something on the right of the equal sign. I'm sure you had it right too. 
All right, so the answer for this is around 400 degrees C. If you do the interpolation in the table, it's a little bit above 400. But how did you get that? Okay, when you're um, starting a new problem like this, this is a review out of Thermo 1. What you want to do is I recommend you make a list of properties. And so you're thinking, I start at state one, I end at state two, I start with a given pressure, a given temperature, and then what's my generic list of properties in this class? It's specific volume, internal energy, enthalpy, entropy, and now exergy. And we could think of those all at state one. And we think of the state principle. That was way back in chapter one. And we think, if we have two independent intensive properties, it fixes the state. And once I know the state, theoretically, sometimes it's a lot of work, but theoretically I can get the other properties. So I look at this at state one, and the pressure was given, right? The pressure was given to be 0.7 bar, and the temperature was given to 200 degrees C. If those two are the independent intensive properties like they are for this, it fixes the state. It's almost too easy because you said, oh, that's superheated and you went to the steam table at 0.7 bar, 200 degrees C, and you said, there's my specific volume at state one, there's my internal energy, if I need it, I don't need it for this problem, but that would be my enthalpy at state one, and there's my entropy at state one. See what we just did? We just got V1, U1, H1, S1, and you could theoretically get, it's a lot of work, but, or they could have tabulated it in the table if they wanted to and saved us a lot of work, but they didn't. The exergy at state one. Okay. There's other properties. You could put in, you know, the specific heat constant volume. There's a lot of properties, but these are the core properties that we deal with. Okay. Then we make the same list over here. P2, T2, V2, U2, H2, S2, and E2. And we say which properties were given in the problem statement. And you just copy those over and you say, oh, it's one bar in the problem statement. But there's not another one given in the problem statement, is there? So you have to deduce it. And the students that figured this out said, hmm, I read the problem probably about two or three times over and look for keywords. And what is the key word, those that got this right? It's rigid. Yeah, that's the key word. It's rigid tank. So did the total volume of the tank change from V1 to V2? It's the same. Did the mass change? No, the mass 1, mass 2 stayed the same. Hence, which of these properties? Yeah, specific volume at state 2 is equal to the specific volume at state 1. And then I look up, and hopefully can do that, it's a little harder, can I look up all the other properties knowing just P and V? Well, what pressure are we at? Yeah, one bar. So we go to our steam table and we say, okay, we're at one bar pressure, and I need this specific volume, 3.108. And I look down and I say, well, too low, too low, too low too high, it's somewhere here. That's why I asked, don't do the interpolation. 3.103 is close enough. I couldn't get any better numbers, right? So the temperature is, the final temperature T2 is 400. What is U2 if you needed it? This is U2. What is H2 if you need it? Right there, H2. And what is S2 if you need it? Right there. Again, this was S1, this was uh, U1, and this was uh, V1. Hopefully a good review. So we're done with that part. Let's go and continue this same problem. And we answer this question for part B. During this process, what is the heat transfer? I'm going to pause and walk around and... Hopefully, I'll get five to answer this question. All right, sometimes I ask uh, easy questions. Those that got it right picked up on this term right here. 
well insulated tank. So if it's well insulated, does that mean it's isothermal? Does that mean T is constant? That's one of those tricky concepts out of thermo one. Well insulated simply means that the Q is equal to zero. Now, somebody could write zero BTUs, they could write zero kilojoules, or they could just leave it off of the dimensions. It's kind of an interesting thing. Somebody says, uh, I heard you're in debt. Yeah, I'm in debt. How much money do you owe? I owe $100, but I'm paying it down. Next week, I'll owe $50. And then the following week, I'll owe $10. And then I'm going to finally pay it all off. I'm going to owe $0. But you know, $0 is the same as zero cents, as well as zero billions or whatever, you know, the other denom zero pounds. <laughs> and it's a similar concept. It doesn't mean that $10 is equal to 10 cents or British pounds or euros or whatever. But, but when you do get the zero, it's like you're, you're free to leave the units off. <laughs> and this is one of those cases where you could put Q is equal to zero, no units, and I'd be just as happy. Or you could put U Q is equal to zero with the kilojoules, and I would be just as happy. And if you want to be a smart aleck, you can put in you know, whatever. <laughs> Something else just to play. All right, let's continue on. What is the work transferred during this process? So what is W, and if I, I like to put the subscript 1 to 2 at times. So what's the work transfer for this process? Should I leave that table up in case you don't bring your appendix? I'll leave this table up in case you didn't bring your appendix. Okay, for those that did uh, get the, this correct, how did you calculate this work? What's the method that you used? Do the first law, right? So the first law had uh, mass times U2 minus U1 equal to Q1 to 2 minus the work 1 to 2. This was 0 because it's well insulated. These two properties we look up, we have the 5 kilograms. You've got to watch out for that negative sign because for this system with the paddle wheel like this and the system being the steam, the system is the steam, is it a positive work out of the steam? No, it's a negative work out of the steam, really a work into the steam. So the best answer is negative 155 to three significant digits. I know a lot of people gave it to me in four. That's fine. Zero kilojoules. The negative sign I didn't correct anybody on, but you want to be consistent with it. Yes? What is the change in the exergy? So the substance is the steam. And you have the final exergy of the steam compared to the initial exergy of the steam. How am I going to calculate it? Do I calculate it by just considering it to be a property? And then I would multiply the mass times U2 minus U1 plus P0 V2 minus V1 minus T0 S2 minus S1. Does that look reasonable? And you can see it's kind of a three terms. Which one of those groups of three terms is zero? The one in the middle, because it's a rigid. V1 is equal to V2, so this is right away zero, isn't it? OK. So that's one way to calculate it, just going back and saying it's a property, and I can calculate a property. And I looked up all these U's and S's out of the table. Is there another way to calculate the change in the exergy, a different way? Okay, if you do that, you'll get this answer, 740 kilojoules. So the change in the exergy is 740 kilojoules, and that's the correct answer. Is there another way that you could get this answer? Exergy balance. Sure can. So what does the exergy balance equation look like? Well, the change in the exergy is sort of the exergy transferred with the Q. Then we have minus the exergy transfer with the work. And that's a 
useful, we're going to have to subtract off any non-useful. So it's a little tricky on this. It's useful. And then we have uh, minus any exergy destruction. All right. Well, what is the exergy transfer with the heat? Zero. What is that exergy transfer with the work? Only the useful component. Well, we think back to our system. Didn't it have a paddle wheel? There's no non-useful pushing back the environment in this problem. It's 100% of the work transfer. So this, so it's zero. Then you're going to have the minus uh, that work we calculated to be uh, 1550 kilojoules. Now, I pause for a second and just focus on these two terms. If I have that work transfer, I'm going to need that negative sign on that W and then another negative sign because wouldn't it increase the exergy of the system? It's like, I know I don't like these negative signs, but it's a negative of a negative. That's the way it is. Okay, and then we're going to have this exergy destruction. Hey, if I could get entropy generation, then I could multiply by T naught. Okay, how do I get sigma? I have to do a little work to get sigma, don't I? I have to go and do a an second law analysis of this problem to get sigma. Okay, what does the second law look like for this problem? So it would, would be the final M times S2 minus S1. I'm going to use those lowercase s's here, the specific entropies, equal to the entropy transfer with the heat, that was some integral, 1 over Tb del Q. But what was del Q? Zero, so there's no entropy transfer with the heat. And then what do we have? We have the um, entropy generation. So this sigma entropy generation is just M times S2 minus S1. So you come in here, and you'll have 0 minus a negative 1550 kilojoules, then you'll have minus 298 times the M times the S2 minus S1. Both of these are consistent. Both will give you the same answer. Yeah, you'll get the same answer of the, the change in the exergy of the system is. Will, what is, for part E, same problem. What is the exergy transfer with the work? And I just answered that on the previous slide. So how about five people who haven't answered one before? I'm going to pause, walk around. Five new people. We had a faculty member here. All right, so a lot of us got it. What I would do for this one is I would put the EW, so it's the exergy transfer with the work. I, that's the notation the book has used. This will be negative 1550 kilojoules, only good to three significant digits, not four. And uh, there is a negative sign here indicating that it's the exergy transfer is not positive out because it's negative, it's actually in. And so that's our answer for that part. What about the exergy destruction? Well, in the interest of time, how would you calculate the exergy destruction? Yeah, you did, we did it on the other slide for the other one, so it would be T naught times entropy production. Or you could go back and use the exergy balance um, if you didn't use it before. And you find out that there's a exergy destruction is 813 kilojoules. Hey, should that be negative or positive? If you get a negative exergy destruction, look for your error because it's just like sigma. Sigma cannot be negative. That would be a violation of the second law. That finishes this section. We've emphasized our new property called exergy. I put it on a specific uh, basis per unit mass basis, as well as the exergy balance for a closed system.